I'm going to mute everybody. I'll ask Dr. Toss to unmute. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to have everybody join us for our Training Wheels Off support uh, group for Parkinson's. We're, uh, we have our monthly guest this month. We're, we're uh, blessed to have a uh, Dr. Peter Toss from Stanford University. Uh, he pines, has pioneered the development of uh, devices to help uh, people with Parkinson's, uh, and we look forward to his presentation to be followed by a Q&A. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Toss. Thank you so much. Thanks, Roger, for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Do you see my screen now, the presentation? Yes, we do. So what I'm what I'm going to do is I I explain to you the main principles of this approach. It's it goes far beyond just ribotectile stimulation, and I'll talk about the first steps. This was initially designed. I initially designed it to uh, for to improve deep brain stimulation, and then I will talk uh, in detail about ribotectile and in particular the glove stimulation. So Parkinson's disease is characterized by abnormal neuronal synchrony. Synchrony in, in itself might, might sound nice and beautiful intuitively, but it has a, uh, comes with huge problems. If there's too much synchrony, neurons that should do different information processing jobs are no longer able to do this. But if all neurons do the same thing, it's like, for example, if, if you consider a company where every employee does the exact same thing, that doesn't work. And since um, since activity and synaptic connectivity, so the connections between the neurons and the activity of the of the neurons are very closely connected. Uh, Parkinson patients do also have characteristic patterns of abnormal synaptic connectivity. So the wiring between neurons is no is is abnormal, and that's a huge problem. Here you, here you see a, a video of standard deep brain stimulation. This is a Parkinson patient, 48 years old, right-handed person, is no longer able to work because of the pronounced tremor. It's also right-sided Parkinson's. And he received treatment DBS in the VIM, the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus that's here. Here's the cable under the skin, and here's the, the implantable pulse generator. And what you see now, and that's the important message, is when you turn off and you turn stimulation off, symptoms come back immediately. And that's particularly pronounced for the thalamic target that's used for tremor. And um, there are no long-lasting effects. And this this initiated this development. I was I was impressed by that time um, by the effect size of the treatment. But I was also somewhat, let's say, concerned about the unphysiological permanent type of stimulation that's been used. And high frequency deep brain, so the standard deep brain stimulation, it means that you permanently deliver stimulation to a specific target or several targets in the brain at more than a rate of typically more than uh, 100 hertz has no long lasting therapeutic effects both the therapeutic effect but also the side effects vanish typically vanish when you turn off stimulation however it may have relevant side effects in the meantime there's even the term dbs induced movement disorders and uh, in particular, it can result in a um, deterioration of speech, and it does not really help um, reliably improve gait and other actual symptoms. That's a huge limitation of deep brain stimulation. And the the approach I'm talking to today is is um, um, based on theory. It's based on modeling and computation and mathematics, physics, basically on taking into account um, self-organization principles in the in the nervous system. And the very point from the very beginning was to specifically counteract abnormal neuronal synchronization by desynchronization. That's not trivial because 
um, the initial thought was that deep brain stimulation is basically something like a temporary lesion, a functional lesion that shuts off neuronal firing. And the, the important thing about desynchronization is that um, if there are different stable states, if a network can be in qualitatively different states, for example, it can be, and this is shown here in, in, uh, schematically, if these neurons, the balls are neurons, they are strongly connected and they fire in synchrony. So this is the time axis, these, this is the neuron index, and you see that nearly everybody fires at the same time rhythmically, all of them doing the same discharges. This, the same network can, can be in a qualitatively very, very different state, loosely connected, everybody doing their own firing, not at the same time, not connected at all, very desynchronized. And plastic neural networks, and it's, we've shown this mathematically and other groups have shown this also, plastic neural networks can, can, be, can show a, a huge variety of different dynamic states. And that's the challenge, uh, that's the, the man, or the, that comes with an enormous therapeutic potential. Because what you want to do is we want to move such a neural network from a pathological attractor state, if you think of a landscape, energy landscape, and the ball is sitting in, um, in, in a pathological attractor and the desynchronizing stimulation moves it across this, to the top of the hill into the so-called basin of attraction of a healthy state. And that's exactly what we want to do. So in other words, we want to make networks unlearn their abnormal connections so that on a long-term basis, they fire differently. They are active in a qualitatively very, very different way. And that's the very point. It's not just that you want to stimulate and so to speak suppress neuronal firing while we are stimulating. And as soon as we turn off, the, the entire abnormal synchrony comes back again. What we want to do is we want to retrain, we want to unlearn um, abnormal connectivity and hence the ability to produce abnormal neuronal firing. And what we use is we've developed a number of stimulation techniques and a very robust one suitable for clinical applications is coordinated reset. Coordinated reset means that you stimulate, if, there, if this is a bunch of neurons, a large portion of neurons that are synchronously active, that we stimulate different sites at different times in a weak way. So we do not, weak means we do not suppress the neuronal firing. What we do is we, we cause a reset, a restart of the rhythm of the different subpopulations of these different, that each neuron is, is um, signified as, as illustrated as a ball, gray ball. So we stimulate different subpopulations at different sites. And by stimulating at different sites, we reset the rhythm so they are no longer in synchrony. But they, what we call, what we induce is what's called a phase shift. So they're out of sync. That's the thing, that's what we do. And <clears throat> this causes cluster states and they run through desynchronized states. So the details are not important, but the important thing is if you do this for a sufficiently long time, the neurons that do no longer talk to each other perfectly or oftentimes they lose their connections. That's the important thing. So then the brain is not a hardwired uh, type of thing, like for example, a computer, but the connections are dynamic and they're adapted to activity. And that's what we use. This very fundamental learning principle in the nervous system is what we use to make neurons unlearn the ability to produce abnormal neuronal synchrony. And this is how the, the, this pattern looks like. It has a periodic backbone. So this is period, typically in the range for deep brain stimulation in five hertz range. And, um, this is weird, by the way, this drawing type of thing. And, um, and we deliver, um, periodically deliver sequences and these sequences are randomized. So three sequences with stimuli, two sequences off. And it's a very weak stimulation. We, we need considerably less stimulus current cons compared to um, standard deep brain stimulation. And, 
here what here's what you see how it looks like in a in a monkey in a Parkinsonian monkey. So this is seconds to show you a six and four velocities to show you um, a representative ten minutes time window. This is a measurement cage that um, with the light barrier systems and the, each monkey, every monkey was in such a such me, in this measurement system every day in order to record the movement production rate to have an objective measure from, for um, treatment effect. There's a little hat that protects the electrode from being pulled out. It was an external externalized stimulation. So there's an electrode implanted in the brain and then we have a connection to an external stimulator and the monkeys were stimulated only for two hours a day on five consecutive days. So not much, only two hours a day on five consecutive days. And these monkeys, these were macaca mulata, they don't have tremor in the Parkinsonian state. They are rendered Parkinsonian by means of MPTP, a neurotoxic substance that selectively destroys dopamine producing cells. And, um, after an MPTP treatment, they're only between five and 10% of the dopamine producing cells left. So this corresponds to very, very late stage Parkinson's disease. And this is the same monkey after only two hours, sorry, after, um, sorry, there's a glitch of this thing. This one video missing, we just realized this. I'm so sorry. Let me just check. Let me just unshare and share again because I'd like to show you this video for whatever reasons. So this is the same monkey and same monkey, no medication at all. And um, after two hours, so this is before the stimulation, the video you've just seen, and this is after two hours of stimulation, same monkey and the monkey behaves, the monkey behaved like normal monkeys. So the same movement production rate, and that's important. So they, these monkeys were, had a huge lack of dopamine and the dopamine resulted in a massive change that's known of connectivity, abnormal uh, connectivity patterns. Nonetheless, already this two hour session had a dramatic impact on the monkey's behavior. It goes on like this on the time and now I have to stop share again and go back to the other, I'm sorry, to the other presentation that I made for today. And this way we got rid of the red lines, that's nice. And this is just briefly. Um, so this is the monkey's mobility in case you're interested in a bit more details and this is, this is the mean standard deviation of all monkeys over all five days. And this is um, with classical DBS, standard deep brain stimulation. And this is the increase. So we stimulated the, the, the monkeys for two hours, took them with different types of stimulation, classical standard DBS and CR coordinated reset. It was a cross, so-called crossover design. We stimulated them put them into a measurement cage. And then these are the five five days after stimulation. You see, you see a non-significant, but an increase after the in 19 minutes after the two hours session with classical DBS. And this is what we observe with, high, with coordinated reset stimulation at this low intensity, considerably weaker um, intensity, a third of the impulses required for standard deep brain stimulation. It lasts for up to four weeks. And there have been a number 
of, of studies by independent groups um, reproducing this effect. We've also shown this in a proof of concept in Parkinson patients with unilateral uh, deep brain stimulation. At that time, for technical reasons, we were only able to stimulate one SDN, I mean, one side of the brain unilaterally. And <clears throat> patients were, and that's a standard procedure in neurosurgery, they, were, they had their electrodes implanted, but not yet their cables and the, and the implantable pulse generator. And we stimulated them, them through a portable stimulator and were measuring, the, uh, we're stimulating them two times two hours a day during three consecutive days. And we were recording on the one hand or measuring on the one hand their motor scores, a standard clinical exam um, from top to toe in order to, to assess motor um, signs. And plus we also recorded abnormal brain activity. Here see typical patient, 49 years old patient. So this is before operation, the patient have, apart from Parkinson's right-sided and right-handed Parkinson patients. She also suffered from a dystonia. She wasn't able to stretch her fingers. She was not told to stretch her fingers, but wasn't able to do so because of the dystonia. And this is now directly before CR stimulation. See, um, she has full-blown symptoms, tremor, dys dystonia, and we were recording muscular activity, EG activity, uh, local field potentials, ECG. And this is now about 20 minutes after turning on the R stimulation and the symptoms are gone. Tremor is gone, rigidity was also gone. And remarkably also dystonia because dystonia doesn't really respond um, quickly and then probably not that well to STN stimulation. And this, this is the important message. This is now one hour after turning off stimulation. And you see that the effects persist. It's very, very different compared to standard high frequency stimulation. Very different. And we've also, um, we've also um, analyzed the local field potentials, the brain oscillations. We recorded from those um, contacts that were also from the pair of contacts that was also used for stimulation. And what you see here is the x-axis is the frequency telling you the, the number or the, which, which brain rhythm is involved and the y-axis is the spectral power. And this is before stimulation. So you see the pronounced about five Hertz peak, the tremor related peak, and this um, beta band higher frequency 16, 17, 18 Hertz peak that uh, corresponds to rigidity and akinesia or bradykinesia. And this is the situation one hour, one hour after turning off CR stimulation after in total four hour stimulation. You see that the rhythms are gone. It's very, very different compared to high frequency stimulation. And, and that it's been shown in detail that for effective high frequency stimulation, for example, delivering clinically effective high frequency stimulation, stopping high frequency stimulation, this peak comes back within 12 seconds and this even quicker. So it's a huge difference. Already relatively short stimulation epochs do have an impact. And there are different types of um, plasticity mechanism. And ultimately, for example, there are synaptic, there are synaptic plasticity, but the strength of the connection increases or decreases depending on the amount of synchrony. And there's also the so-called structural plasticity where connections may even vanish. So the number of connections may even decrease if neurons are no longer synchronized. And that's our ultimate goal. But of course, it takes time. It's not something that happens immediately. And this is just briefly the, what we've seen in all these the initial patients. It's the exact same thing. Decrease of beautiful, pronounced decrease of symptoms and decrease of abnormal rhythmic activity. Now the goal is, um, while we're still working on this, and while we'll also do, do further trial, and we've done also lots of computational modeling to further improve this for deep brain stimulation, one goal was to provide patients with a non-invasive approach. So the question was, can we do this non-invasively? And again, 
um, guided by computational work, the prediction was, yes, we should do, we should be able to do this. And this is simply because there have been studies in the 80s or last century showing that rhythmically active neurons can be reset, their rhythm can be restarted by very different stimuli, by all sorts of stimuli, by electrically stimulating um, the cell body, axons, dendrites, synapses, by even by thermal, optical, and chemical, all sorts of stimuli. So we use a very fundamental phase, re phase resetting type of stimulus, and that's what we need because we don't want to suppress neuronal firing. We don't want to shut them down. The only thing what you want to do is that we want to have a bunch of neurons that are normally synchronized, and we want to control the timing discharges, the timing of the discharge in order to disrupt the abnormal synchrony. And this is possible because of the following, for the following reason. There's been a, a series of really beautiful studies by Wise and co-workers, it's Lenz's group, and they've shown the following. During implantations, electrode implantations in the OR, in, um, they've shown it in Parkinson patients, in patients with essential tremor, patients with dystonia, patients after uh, with chronic stroke or uh, after stroke. They've shown the following. When you stimulate, for example, the skin with a vibration, what happens in the, the key proprioceptive hub, so the, the part in the brain that receives the input from the skin is the following, is that the, the neurons fire in synchrony to, with, this, with the peripheral vibration. So if this is the vibration signal, the neurons fire in synchrony to it. And that's the important point. So in other words, we can control the firing of these neurons. And this is shown here for those who are interested in a bit um, more detail. So this is the x-axis is one cycle of the peripheral vibration and the y-axis shows you the so-called cycle histogram. So how often a typical neuron discharges. If, there's, uh, if, there, was, if there was no um, relationship between the firing and the vibration, it would be a noisy flat line, but you see this beautiful phase locking, this beautiful entrainment. In other words, there's a predominant phase at which these neurons discharge, and that's our chance. Although we are far away from the brain when stimulating the fingertips, we nevertheless can control the firing of a very crucial part of the, of the human brain in a very precise manner. And that's the important, important thing. And it's also been shown in monkeys that the same holds also for the cortex. So it's not just the thalamus, but it's also the cortex, two main hubs that are involved in the Parkinson's in brain circuits, motor circuits, and sensory circuits that are so important for Parkinson's disease. And now why fingertip stimulation? Fingertip stimulation and the glove stimulation is the first thing, first step we do. We are we're also developing further techniques. But why the fingertips? Simply because the fingertips are small, um, uh, small represent a small surface of the entire skin surface, but their representation on the cortex, the volume of neurons that's activated by activating the fingertips is huge. So as you can see, if some this is the entire. Um, for example, sensory motor cortex or sensory cortex or motor cortex. And then see that a huge portion is represented by the fingers. And this is the homunculus, uh, Penfield's homunculus that represents, that illustrates this. And that's why we started with the fingertips. And this was the first generation type of glove we used, so vibratory stimulators for each fingertips, only four fingertips, thumb is without stimulation. And then this is how it looks like. So it's basically the same pattern compared to what we did before for electrical deep brain stimulation. But however, we just re replaced electrical bursts delivered through depth electrodes by vibratory bursts del delivered through the fingertips. And you see again this periodic backbone 
and then we deliver these sequences and we randomize the sequences from tri between tri um, different uh, cycles from cycle to cycle and this, ha this has lots of reasons and all this has been optimized this this is most robust and that's why we do it like this now i'll show you a, a three month data from a three month pilot study in um, this was the time initially this study was planned for 20 patients, two years, but then we were hit by COVID and therefore um, we ended up on, unfortunately only with six patients, but the results are very encouraging. What you see here in, on this slide and in the following slides is these are all, all these data of medication data. That means it, um, the data uh, obtained after thorough medication withdrawal depending on the half-life of the medication. Medi medication was withdrawn between, for between um, 12 up to 48 hours. So patients came in in the morning at eight o'clock. And this is what's shown here at eight o'clock, typically not in their best state, of course, after medication withdrawal. Then we did this clinical exam, standard MDSU PDRS part three motor score. Then they received two times two hours with a glove treatment and in between a lunch break. And then at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, we did this exam again. And the patients did not receive any medication during that time. So they were already off in the morning and they didn't receive any medication. Nevertheless, they improved, further improved, only um, receiving the glove treatment. That's important. Second, we wanted to know not only what's the so-called acute effect, but what's the effect evolving over time. And for this, we started, um, this was on one day, on one visit day, and then next visit day, the treatment started. Patients were again withdrawn um, from their uh, medication, so they were off medication. And then um, they, they went home, use their medication, their typical medication, but, but also use the glove between two to four hours a day. Four hours meaning two times two hours a day. And then after three months, they came back again, again with medication withdrawal. And the important point with medication withdrawal is you want to study, when you have two interventions, two different or different types of interventions, you want to, and you, that's also something that's done with deep, deep brain stimulation, in deep brain stimulation studies, you typically do med medication withdrawal. It's not, it's not convenient for patients. It's sometimes tough for them and they're frightened, but our patients were surprised because they did quite well, only with the, as you can see here, only with the glove treatment. But the important point is you want to really understand how the brain is acting without medication so that you can fear changes of, for example, UPDRS scores, motor scores, and can, can disentangle the effect of medication versus glove treatment. And you see there's also significant improvement over the course of three months. And that's important. So patients really got better over three months. And now the question is, was it only statistically, were they only statistically getting better or clinically, was it meaningful? And for this, there's the concept of the MCID, the minimally clinically identifiable difference. And it's a bar, it's a hurdle. In this case, it's minus 3.25, it's well evaluated. And this says, when the scores decrease by more than 3.25, it's a clinically meaningful improvement. So in the acute effects on day, on this first visit day, where we stimulate with patients in the morning, uh, um, so they came in at eight and we stimulated them two times and in the afternoon we measured them, leaving them without any medication all the time. Five of these six patients had a clinically significant uh, improvement and one patient was at least not deteriorating at a slight improvement, but all of them were off medication. That's important. <clears throat> and long-term concerning the three months effect, all of the six patients had a clinically significant improvement. So this was quite encouraging for us. And um, 
most of the patients decreased their medication. So this is baseline, this is after three months. So most of them decreased their medication. Several of them simply because they had um, relevant side effects and were able to decrease them, didn't need so much dopa or whatever medication they uh, were taking before. And then there was one finding that was very pronounced and also surprising to me because whenever you do uh, electrophysiology in Parkinson patients, it's relatively easy and relatively simple to see these abnormal brain oscillations in the depth of the brain. When you do recordings from the depth from these stimulation electrodes, you see it by simple visual inspection. There are huge waves of abnormal discharges, so to speak. But the the electroencephalography is is way more complicated. It's it's not that obvious. Nevertheless, we've seen very pronounced effects. So what you see is a group analysis. So we analyzed each single patient and then we transformed the the results on the uh, on a reference brain the montreal neurological institute reference brain and um, we looked at the different frequency bands and we focused in, because we only had these uh, small sample of patients we focused on the sensor motor cortex the primary motor cortex primary sensor cortex they're important very important for parkinson's disease and what you see here color coded is is the power the amount the strength of synchrony so to speak and the strongest synchrony is in red and or in orange and weak is in in weakest is in blue and this is before stimulation so baseline and again off medication after medication withdrawal that's important because um again we don't want to to the, the electroencephalography recordings to be um, influenced by any medication. So off medication before the treatment and off medication after three months of treatment. And you already, by, by simple um, visual inspection, you see this huge difference. And statistically, of course, it's hugely significant. So there's a strong decrease of the abnormal Parkinson's related so-called beta band synchrony in the sensory motor cortex. And here's, here's a case series in, in patients that we are able to follow up pre-COVID, but also during the COVID time um, for a rather long time. So this is the x-axis shows you the days of ribotactile treatment. This is about nine months. This is um, six about six months. This is six months, two, two times, um, two to four hours a day in total one month pre-planned pause, no stimulation to see whether the effects persist. And these are six months with um, with maintenance dose only, meaning two to three times, two hours a week. So considerably less. That's what we see. So after a few months, patients don't need um, um, much stimulation any, anymore and it's it's sufficient to reduce to significantly reduce the dosage and what you see and again these um, motor motor scores the NDS UPDS part three motor scores the standard motors motor exam for Parkinson's these scores decrease over time and that's that was super encouraging for us simply for the following reason this is nine months and what, what you see, and that's been shown in a couple of studies, is that patients with best medical treatment deteriorate over time because the treatment is progressing. So what you would expect is a slight increase, depending on the study, it's a five points, an increase by five points um, a, a per year, something like that. There are different different studies came up with different values. And typically, and a couple of studies have already shown that on the group level, patients linearly increase, get, get worse in a linear way. And what you see is that these patients really improve significantly. So without me measured without medication, and they, for example, they half in their scores, nearly, it's nearly half the scores. It's an effect size like DBS, but measured off medication that's the super important thing so um uh, it's a lasting effect something changed in their brain to make this happen and 
I show you now a few videos in order to illustrate this because numbers, bars, and, and all these uh, curves and whatever diagrams are nice, but the important thing is how it looks like in patients. So this is a Parkinson patient who was diagnosed in 2007, early onset, and he took a huge amount of medication. He was about 50% of his time in an off time. He mainly had to lie down because he was so stiff, wasn't able to move. He used the cane, four-point cane. He was supposed to use a wheelchair because he was falling more and more often. And here the patient is, oops. Here the, sorry, this meter doesn't work. The patient is simply asked to enter, enter the room. And he was close to his best on, he was fluctuating and he, in this state, he was close to his best on state. And you see, you're unfortunately familiar with this, the small steps, no facial expression, the arms are not swinging. And then he came to us I, and I instructed him to take as much medication as necessary. So there was no, no instruction to reduce medication at all. The goal was the, the well-being of the patient, not the reduction of the medication or something like that. And since most of the medication was short acting, he, he basically took Covidopa, Lipidopa whenever it was necessary. And from day one on, he was dropping down to six, six to seven. And then during just for some like nine to 12 months and then even further reduced it. So instead of 25, 20, 25 to only six. And this was the first evening, patient on the first evening. You see the nice large steps, the arms are swinging, facials, facial expressions are back. And this is the same patient, he then went home um, and was stimulating two hours a day. Initially, was only stimulating two hours a day. Had a huge improvement. This is day six. Sorry, I don't know why the videos are not properly working. So this is day six, and he told us that he was able to start working again, and. The interesting thing is that he then also, after about a week, he, he said that he noticed that his sense of smell and taste came back because he was cooking for the family before and he was um, pre-Parkinson's and on weekends, but he was no longer able to do this simply because he wasn't able to smell and smell anything and his sense of smell and taste were gone. And we were very surprised. We didn't examine this systematically because we didn't expect this. It's a classical non-motor symptom of Parkinson's. It's often a precursor, typically precursor of Parkinson's. And other patients, for example, reported that they were, um, that they had a return of their sense of smell and taste in, in the sense, for example, that they um, had a Pennsylvania smell test and were able to detect only one out of 40 odors. One of our patients reported that he was only able to detect wood fire before he started with the glove treatment. And then after three months, he was able to detect all of these odors again. And this is why we are currently starting an early stage um, study and uh, studying early stage patients. It's done um, work to be done together with Zara Patel here from the otolaryngology um, um, department, where we, where we study the impact of, of uh, the glove treatment on olfaction, but also on vision, because our patients also reported improvements of vision, early signs of Parkinson's are also vision, and they're nice markers. Uh, for example, the, the delay of evoked, visual evoked responses, they, they nicely correlate to symptoms. 
And finally, the patient, he was not, he was not a runner before, um, but then uh, he started running, was able to run, and then did his first New York Marathon a few months after he started the glove treatment. This was in November 2018, and then finally even a triathlon. So this is And then in 2022, this first, um, his first triathlon, he's now using the glove for five years. Uh, in the meantime, only once a week, one, once two hours a week. So the good thing is that initially it's good to start with higher dose, so like four hours a day. But then after, after a few, a few months, the dose can be reduced. And then uh, the maintenance dose is, is quite low. He's doing really great. This is another patient, early onset patient, who was diagnosed at the age of 27. In, this is um, off medication prior to the vibrotactile treatment. And he was, I don't know, I'm so sorry. I have really excellent internet connection here. I don't know why these videos don't work. So you see that the right side is on the one hand, not move quite stiff. He did also a trim of the right side. He was no longer able to do his workout. He did lots of workout in, with the goal to cope with his condition. And he was planned, he was scheduled for a deep brain stimulation um, uh, in September 2019, if I remember correctly. He came to us in July 2019. and. This is the video he sent me after six weeks of vibrotactile stimulation. Ah, I'm so sorry with these videos. No. And he's he, he is still not. Um, He's not been going for DBS, he's doing quite well. And this is another patient um, with, who is shuffling a lot. So uh, fascination is a huge problem for him. This is the first day, first visit day off medication. And as you can, typically Parkinson patients do have this shuffling when they have to enter exit rooms, when they have to change their gait speed, or in particular, when they have to turn around, we force, we evoke this, so to speak. Now you can see the patient has to stop and restart again. We reinforce this by asking patients to turn around in a narrow hallway, as you can see now. And then you can see what, what was really bothering the patient. And sometimes he was not even able to enter normal smooth gait, but he was walking in this, sort of jogging type of mode, which was a huge problem for him. Same same on medication, but we, we measured him, we examined him off medication that was important. And then what you, what you see here, and this is quite instructive, I think this video is the following. This is after three months, again, off medication, so that we really understand what's the situation without the medication, not influenced by medication, but by the glove. And you see that the patient is already better. He reported that shuffling with medication, shuffling was no longer an issue, but, oops, again, the problem. But this is to, to illustrate why we do these exams of medication. You see that the right arm is not properly swinging, right side is, and, and also now when turning around, he shuffles a bit, considerably better than before, but still, he's still not okay. And this is why we do this, because he said when 
when he takes his medication, he has no issues anymore, practically no issues anymore with shuffling. And this is the reason why we, why we do the off medication exams to really be able to thoroughly study what's going on. And this is after five months of glove treatment. Uh, I really have to apologize. I don't know why. And this is after six months and a pre one month pre-plan pause. So six months of treatment for two to four hours a day, and then one month without any glove treatment. And this is hopefully this video will. Yeah. Mm. And um, I'm sorry for all these video issues. I'll ask IT what's what's the reason for this. I've never experienced this before. Um, and we were able, although we were hit by um, COVID, we were able to follow up three of these patients during for a long period of time. So they were able to stimulate for six months with high dose, two to four hours a day, one month pre plan pause, six months with low dose, maintenance dose, one to three times, two hours per week only. And then they returned the stimulators and they had after effects for one to one and a half years, meaning reduced, massively reduced medication, massively reduced motor scores for between one and one and a half years. And since then they're slowly re-increasing. So it's really substantial. It takes some time. It's not this on off type of phenomenon. We know from deep brain stimulation, it takes some time. It's like if you just have to save money in order to buy a car or whatever, you, you, you typically can't to save enough on one day. So you have to invest something. But the, the good thing about it is your brain changes. So it's the same thing. We use, we use plasticity mechanisms, learning mechanisms of the neural system. You, you have similar mechanisms, for example, when you want to learn to play an instrument. You don't learn to play an instrument in just one afternoon. So it takes some time, but you won't forget it that fast. And that's the important thing. So it really has long lasting after effects. What we have done is we have, we have developed the next generation type of glove system you see here. It's wireless and um, patients that, 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 use, that are using it so far, they really like it. And these controllers are really lightweight and, and easy to charge. And the important thing is we can we further improve also the waveforms, the vibratory waveforms. And there's, there are a couple of improvements also regarding the fixation means of the stimulators and all this. We've just restarted studies and we have a very carefully thought through um, clinical development plan. So we start with um, couple of pilot studies addressing specific questions, uh, for example, in advanced stage, in advanced stage patients, also with electroencephalography in early stage patients, as I mentioned before. And then we'll soon start a, a controlled study. And as soon as we, um, in, in about um, two times 17, 35 patients, and then uh, at an interim, evaluation and if we're doing everything well because the point is what you want to do is we want to de-risk the, the entire approach you could have a treatment that really works well but if the studies are not properly done this can kill a, a treatment so to speak for example when you do just as an example when you do for example sham stimulation sham should be you always have to show that it's not placebo we don't we don't believe that uh, we wouldn't expect that these are placebo effects for a couple of reasons on the one hand these effects, as you've seen, are continuous. Placebo effects are not continuous. They fluctuate. And they're not typically not that long lasting, and particularly not continuously long lasting. The other thing is tremor doesn't really respond that well um, with respect to placebo. And we have 
significant trauma subscores. So trauma responded very nicely to, to the treatment. And third, we had some very un, unpredicted and, and surprising non-motor effects. Uh, so effects on non-motor systems like olfaction, vision, patients reported, for example, that they, that the, the colors were brighter, light was, everything was brighter, and um, they had an improvement of their vision. That's that's understandable, but we didn't expect it. And patients reported it very independently. So the same pattern of improvement was reported by different patients. But nevertheless, the usual thing is what you have to do is you have to do control style, uh, trials. And the control means you have a treatment group, one group that receives the treatment the other group that receives a sham a placebo or sham type of stimulation since it's not pharma it's not a simple thing that you just get a pill without the substance a pill that looks exactly the same than the treatment pill but without substance but we have to have a sham and sham in this case means it has to be a stimulation pattern that's rendered ineffective it's not trivial and um and this is also something we're going to test in this controlled trial to see whether the entire study design and everything is good. And in, if the interim results are looking good, then there would be highly substantial investment to, to pull the trigger for an FDA approval trial. And the goal of the people, and, and our goal, but fortunately also the goal of the people who who will fund all this is to bring it to patients, to all patients as soon as possible. In other words, to achieve, uh, to do all this on the highest level, quality level, and to make it affordable, meaning um, to, to uh, receive, receive not only FDA approval, but reimbursement. That's important to bring it to all Parkinson's patients as soon as possible. And this is the team. I'm very happy that I have superb collaborators. That's the core team here at Stanford. And I'm very grateful for all the donations and the funds and all the funding. And uh, a fantastic lab. Very grateful to work with them. And I want to thank you. And again, my apologies with the videos. I've never experienced this before. I don't know where it comes from, but I hope you it, it was okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Toss. Very much appreciate you being able to uh, give us that presentation. Um, if you could just unshare your sh screen for a minute, I can. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, let me just re spotlight myself. There we go. That was an excellent presentation. We really appreciated that. Um, so, what we'll do now is we'll open it up to QA. Uh, I don't want to take too much of Dr. Tass's valuable time. So, Dr. Tass, let me know when you have to go. We'll definitely I understand that completely. So, if you want if, to ask a question, just either let, electronically raise your hand or physically raise your hand, and I'll call on you and you'll either unmute you or you'll have to unmute yourself. So, who would like to go off? Start first with Randall, a Randall Rothbard, maybe? Go ahead, Randall. Thanks so much. Dr. Dr. Tass, on behalf of thousands, literally thousands of patients, Parkinson's patients. I want to thank you from all of us because you've given us uh, certainly a lot amount, of, a lot of hope to uh, to move forward with some some treatment like this. I wonder what advice you or, or or thoughts you might have with respect to a large portion of people who like like me. I'm I'm 68, who are close to the the threshold in terms of uh, getting DBS. People have been approved for DBS. But can, but the doctors say that after the age of 70, they don't really want to give you DBS anymore because there's other problems that develop as you get older. So for people between a, a large swath of people between 65 and 70 years old now who are literally wanting to get their hands, so to speak, on your on your glove treatment as opposed to going through what you know you've described as a very uh, onerous and um, intrusive uh, DBS uh, uh, program. Um, you know what 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 sort of advice you might give for us in terms of timing, or is there some way to get these gloves on a compassionate use program, if possible, before it's been FDA approved? Or um, and then the flip side of it is, 
if you do get DBS and the gloves come out afterwards, is is can can the gloves work on someone who has had already had DBS? Well, that would be my well, first. Yeah. Well, on on the one hand, um, unfortunately, and and look, it it took us quite some time to develop technically develop this novel that generation of gloves and believe me for me it was i suffered from the time it took so i'd like i would love to be way quicker although we were everybody was working super hard and we have really first rate contractors working for us and unfortunately we have to accept that things take time and rushing rushing into um let's say markets or rushing into developments can can destroy a development that's that, that's something we have to be very aware of what i would suggest is um don't wait using a, a standard and approved treatment um um before it's too late so to speak because the other thing is there's no reason currently we don't we do not have any reason to assume that we couldn't use the gloves in implanted patients. In fact, we're already um, planning, we have an IRB approval for a study in post-surgery um, patients, Parkinson patients after lesioning treatment out of the ultrasound or um, other types of lesioning and unfavorable outcomes. We'll also do a study in, in um, Parkinson patients with um, sensing generators where after implantation part, the patients will receive the glove treatment first only and the stimulator will not stimulate but only sense so that we can really nicely measure not only from the cortex but also from the depth of the brain and we um, I'm, in, I'm in the department of neuro, neurosurgery and with my fellow colleagues in uh, the stereotactic neurosurgeons we have we de definitely plan to to establish a program of co treatment co stimulation program you see so gloves plus dbs there's no ambition i have no ambition to to kill dbs so to speak you know what i mean yeah. the most important point is is the patient's well-being that's number one and um we'll we'll develop the gloves as soon as possible and I would not, I would, if you have a good treatment option and another potentially good treatment option is not yet available, I wouldn't, I would be careful waiting to, for too long. I hope this helps. Thank you, Dr. Toss. Uh, also, we got Jeff Bennett. Go ahead, Jeff. You had a question. Yeah. Um, your work suggests that it's not just a lack of dopamine that causes these symptoms in PD patients. Um, so, and we're seeing, you're seeing a uh, real improvement in their symptoms, despite a lack of dopamine and they're reducing their, their medication. So can you talk a little bit about the interaction between dopamine and coordinated reset? How are those two interplaying? Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, there are a couple of aspects that are relevant here. And one is what we see is that the, the glove treatment sort of replaces dopamine. And uh, I can, so far I can't explain why, I mean, in great detail. And one aspect is, for example, in patients with lipidopa induced dyskinesias, for example, if a patient with lipidopa induced dyskinesias takes too much dopamine, then, for example, dyskinesias may increase. So in these patients, if you do the following, we leave the medication level constant and we start with high dose of, of the glove treatment, like four hours a day in total, dyskinesias increase. So what we do either reduce the medication or start with only two hours. And we have in all patients, we don't have a hundred patients uh, treated so far. And therefore we have to be careful. All this has to be shown in a larger population of patients. But what we've seen is over time, they beautifully respond and the dyskinesias disagree and uh, uh, decrease, sorry, disc de decrease and the, the medication level decreases. And now more specifically to your question. Um, dopamine, the lack of dopamine causes, and that's been shown in many studies in humans on a more macro level, 
um, by means of uh, MRI and connectomic types of analysis, but in many animal studies, the lack of dopamine causes changes of the con uh, connectivity. And this is a very important point. For example, connectivity means that in this case that, for example, maps are distorted. So sensory maps that are corresponding to specific fingers, other parts of the body, they're distorted. And that's known from, for example, from, from uh, animal experiments. And that's a huge thing because that means, for example, that, that the brain is no longer able to figure out where the input actually comes from. It has difficulty making sense of it. What does it correspond to in patients? It corresponds to, for example, a patient having a bunch of coins in the pocket and not being able to figure out what kind of coins these are. So it's known, that, for example, that the receptive fields in Parkinson patients are enlarged. What we see in um, in Parkinson, uh, sorry, in our computational work is that you can induce massive changes of such um, connectivity, abnormal connectivity patterns. And this is one thing. So it's not just about dopamine, it's about what results from dopamine, the maladaptive reaction to the lack of dopamine. And the maladaptive plastic reaction means that there is connectivity that is totally unwanted because it, because it renders the nervous system dysfunctional. The, ner the neurons do no longer work properly. And that's very important. So we do not just treat, for example, do, the, the main goal is here not just to reduce synchrony or whatever, but to, to reshape or to bring these connections to more physiological functioning mode. That's very important. This is, I think, a very, very, very important point. And the third aspect is the following. Um, <clears throat> there are disease, so-called disease models in, in animal experiments, so-called disease models of Parkinson's. And these disease models means you have an animal model that mimics, all of them have their limitation, but nevertheless, we can learn from all these models. Um, these disease models, in these disease models, the symptoms get worse over time. It's really like in a, in a degeneration in what, what you unfortunately observe in patients. And when you, it's, that's a study from, for example, the Würzburg group, um, when, you, when you stimulate with simple standard SDN stimulation in such a rat model early on, what happens is you stop progression or you can even revert it. And that's the important thing because the, even degenera degeneration need not be a one-way street. It can be, there can be reversible processes. I would, I would not rule this out. And this is actually our goal to show this and to work into that, to get into that direction. And for example, it's not a binary thing that all that dopamine producing cells are either living and producing dopamine or they're dead, degenerated and dead, not producing dopamine. There's, it's a spectrum and they're in between there are functional states, for example, where, where the, these neurons do not produce dopamine, but they produce substances that induce inflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation that plays an enormously important role in Parkinson's disease. And if, just as an example, if you, and another aspect in this context is, for example, if you have an enormously synchronized activity, ongoing activity, the metabolic load of these neurons is huge. And the probability with which they die, ultimately die, increases. So what we want to do is, we want to try to do is, we want to rescue these neurons. You see, it's not just about this dopamine and that is superficially or however related to abnormal synchrony, but dopamine, the lack of dopamine induces so many things, so many other things. It causes this cascade of um, changes connectivity changes and also metabolic changes. And therefore I think an effective change of the activity, long lasting change of the activity patterns in these relevant brain areas may have huge impact. Thank you, Dr. Tess, that was very informative. Uh, Bill Barish, you have a question. You have to unmute yourself, Bill. Here you go. Thank you. 
Oh, oh sorry for the dog. Um, the I'm a practicing family doc in Oregon and see a lot of Parkinson's patients um, and deal with their um, hospitalized. Um, my question is, do you foresee, I think the studies have probably not been going on long enough, but do you foresee improvement or arresting of um, dementia associated with Parkinson's disease from the um, these vibratory uh, treatments? Yeah, that's a super important question and super important aspect. Um, what we what we do is um, typical thing in Parkinson's uh, in a way in Parkinson's study we first focus on the motor symptoms, and we we also focus on another non motor symptoms like olfaction and, and vision as I told you before. However, and in the next step, then we'll. Um, with specialists in the field like Kathleen Person and others, we also plan to do studies in dementia patients. Dementia, the dementia symptoms, related symptoms in Parkinson's are even more complex than the motor symptoms. Therefore, this has to be redone properly with the right people, uh, together with the right people. However, and this is just anecdotal and it's not a large population. I've experienced three patients that had clear and in one case really massive cognitive impairment and they had a huge improvement one patient really really the, the family said that he was like 20 years before after uh, about nine after uh, nine months with the glove treatment this can be an outlier type of effect or whatever we don't have a large population but of course these dementia issues are one target of our research too Thank you very much for the question, Dr. Barish, and thank you for the answer, Dr. Toss. Uh, Bill Bill Wilcox, you have to unmute yourself, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, doctor, just wondering, uh, th this glove treatment, is this available other than at your facility? Like, is it available at any other Parkinson's doctors or movement disorder centers? Well, we, we're doing studies here. We've invented it and I've invented it and, and we are doing this. There's another small company that does it. We've worked with them in the past. Stanford has decided not to stop this collaboration. Um, we What we are going to do is as soon as we start the, the FDA approval trial, hopefully by the end of the year or early next year, we'll have a multi-center study with leading centers in the US, also a leading center in Europe. All this is already in preparation, but there will be multi-center studies um, coming in the next months. Great, thank you so much. All right, anybody else have a question? I'm, I'm looking for either your physical hand or digital hand. Oh, go ahead, Ken. You have to unmute yourself, Ken. There you go, go ahead, Ken. Uh, since since with this treatment you have to keep using the gloves, you probably have a good handle on how many people uh, are using gloves currently in the United States or worldwide. We are we are currently we have developed this this new glove uh, generation for quite a while, and we now received um, the first bunch of um, pairs. The problem with the old system, to be very frank and open, was it was way too expensive motors were way too expensive and uh, resulting in costs of a couple of thousand five thousand more per glove pair and which was unrealistic and we fortunately um, i'm now able to work with really leading uh, a leading haptic company a really great uh, electronics company and so on and now for some of the motors cost just a few bucks, although although they are really high standard and in the past it was more than $300, doesn't make any sense per motor. And th this was also a limiting factor in order to roll this out also in studies you see. And now we have these high end, quality wise high end gloves, but we just received them. So we've started the first pilot study last week. We have a wait list of a couple of thousand patients but um, we are speeding up, we are ramping everything up. And um, the goal is to have these, um, let's say a hundred or so patients in the study within the next few months. And, but all this takes time, you see. Um, it's, it's not that you can start a, a study in thousand patients um, 
within a few days or so. But the FDA approval study will then will be um, highest end uh, quality wise, multi center, very large size, and also with really first first rate statisticians. We have uh, Vivek Sharu from the quantitative science uh, unity at Stanford and his team, who is uh, they are they are helping us with the. Uh, and it's fantastic collaboration with the study design, with the statistics, power analysis, and all this stuff. But all this takes time, sometimes more than I'd like, but <laughs> that's the way it is. You have to do it thoroughly. One of the folks asked the question if uh, Kanwar is, has used those new gloves by any chance. Kanwar, Kanwar will, will soon use the new gloves. Oh, nice. Does that answer your question, Ken? Oh, well, he didn't. I, I wanted to know how many people do you think are using them currently because you run trials, like 50 people? I mean, I know the future I understand is, is promising, but I'm just curious. You no, know, we've just, people? we've started, I mean, I I, I um, have patients, had patients, about 40 patients. Okay. I've treated more than about 40 patients, but then we had this pause because yeah. for most of the patients, because of the glove development, and now we are um, massively restarting. Well, you mentioned the fact that some people return their gloves after the trial was over. You would have, I'm surprised you were able to get them back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they, they they will come back. They will come back. All right. Thank you, Ken, for the question. Uh, Charlie, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Will the National Institutes of Health be involved in the uh, FDA study? No. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice because that's in the area here. Will there be one in the Washington DC area? Ah, uh, you mean, you mean uh, uh, it might be, yes. Uh, it is, uh, I, I thought as a funding source, um, not as a funding source. Well, we'll see, we'll see. Hmm. Stay tuned, Charlie. Thanks, Dr. Okay. All right, who else has a question? I'm looking for uh, hands. Marvin Pell here. Go ahead. Uh, is this uh, FDA study, is this going to be phase two or phase three? No, no, phase two. Well, you see uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, this type of terminology, this primarily applies to medication or pharma studies. What you typically talk, what you're typically using, the term you're typically using in the, in the uh, med tech world is pivotal trial. So what we are now doing is pilot studies. We'll soon I'm sorry, start what was that term you used? Pivotal. 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 Okay. Pivotal. Pivotal. Yes. And so what we are now doing is pilot studies, two different and a third very soon. So we have three arms of pilot studies. And then we start a proof of concept study. Proof of concept studies are often used by smaller companies already for FDA approval. We do this in order to de-risk the entire approach to really understand what we are doing with the sham group, with the treatment group to learn more. And then at the, at the point of the interim analysis, when the interim analysis shows that we're doing the right thing. So in other words, the treatment works, but we're also doing the study in a proper way. Then it will start this really huge um, FDA approval tr uh, trial. I know, I know you're just starting and it's very difficult to project, but do you have a feeling for how long it might take to get FDA approval? Think some like two, three years or so, but it's a rough estimate, of course. And there's also significant financial investment, I would assume, as well. As my, I used to work in the medical device field, so I know how much it costs. It's a lot of money. All right, thanks. Yeah, for well, the question. yeah, for, yeah. Fortunately, concerning the financial investment, if the if the data look good, I'm I'm very relaxed about the financial. Fortunately, very relaxed about the financial investment. Well, you, you have a bunch of investors here <laughs> who go for it. You got that right. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, anybody else have a question while I'm standing around for hands? I do. Go ahead, Elinda. Okay. I have a question. I don't really expect an answer, but I will try. I know FDA approval takes a long time. Are there any prototypes that we could use to build our own gloves? I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do this. I, I, would, I really, I really wouldn't do this. You see, the point is, um, my point is not to be very frank and open. My point is not that I, um, that I would like to sit on something in order to make a little bit of money or whatever. That's not. That's definitely not my point. But sure. I'm working on viral tactile stimulation since um, some like nearly fifteen years, and and you 
and there's so many different aspects, even the simple vibration of the fingertip is so complex. I didn't talk about all these details. They might also be boring and would take too much time. I would not do this. And and if if you're doing not the right thing, it might also not be super helpful. And I would not do this. Yeah. Thanks, Linda, for the question and the answer, Dr. Toss. Understandable, but um, yeah. I, mean, I would discourage you. Okay. Um, go ahead, Sue. You have to mute yourself. I know, Dr. Toss, you have several thousand people on the waiting list, but is it practical that any of the people here might get on the list in case there's more need for uh, people? Yes, yes, of course. What we do is, I forgot to say this, what we do is we start with local patients. And uh, we do this simply because the best device can have a, a bug that has, I mean, even Apple and other companies, super successful companies have experienced this, early field failures and things like that. Therefore, we start with local patients that come, can come in every day in case there's whatever, something, or they have issues handling the device, although it's easy to handle. And, and then we'll, we'll include um, also patients, um, non-local patients. We have, we have a, um, um, a, a, an email, it's called Parkinson's VC, VCR, at stanford.edu. Roger might, might have it or I send it to Roger. Yeah, send it to me if you would, please, Dr. Toss. Yeah, of course. And, and, um, and what, what we typically do is it took us also a few months because all these regulatory things take time, unfortunately, is the following. When you, when you, um, contact this email, you'll get, um, an electronic, a link for an electronic IRB approved um, questionnaire. And the goal of this questionnaire is to basically to find out for which study you might qualify. And as soon as there's there's free spot, we'd contact you. Thank you, Dr. Toss. Uh, so one of our, pay one of our uh, folks in a, the group actually has a PSP, not Parkinson's. Do you have any idea if this technology would be something that would be helpful for somebody with PSP? We'll we'll um, we'll go step by step, but uh, certainly these these types of disorders. I mean, it's so important to have to offer treatment. Uh, it will be one of the next things we'll address, of course. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, let's see, somebody's hand raised. Oh, Janet, go ahead. You Hello, can. Dr. Tass. I was wondering, how different is the stimulation to each different patient? Is it individualized? And if so, is it different frequency, different strength and patterns? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we started in the pilot studies. We started basically practically with a one-size-fits-all type of stimulation pattern, which is a good thing in the sense that even this first approach um, um, led to really highly encouraging results. We now have the ability to really personalize it and we'll do this step-by-step. Step. We'll develop this step-by-step step because one part of Parkinson's is also, Parkinson's is not only um, a disorder characterized by motor issues, but also by sensory issues and also by the, there are also issues integrating motor and sensory information. And Parkinson patients do have typically have uh, characteristics, sensory abnormal characteristics. And this is something we can measure and we adapt the way we stimulate to these um, sensory ab uh, abnormalities because they change over time. They change in the course of the treatment. Mm, that makes so, so much sense. And I, I, it was interesting when we had, we actually uh, had Conwar here on November, we interviewed him and he was telling us about the fact that he got his sense of smell and taste back. And that was really amazing because a lot of us have, that was why I, I lost my sense of smell uh, and taste 10 years before I was diagnosed. So that was very, yeah. anybody else have a question they can ask? Well, I don't want to keep you too long, Dr. Tossin. Oh, go ahead, Rich. You have to unmute yourself, Rich Kada. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Um, uh, I actually uh, visited Stanford to and met, met not not personally, but it was kind of virtual in the office, virtual. But it was Doctor Zeefert. Mm -hmm. 
you know her mm -hmm. uh anyway um so I, I like to consider myself a local because because I can be you know I could be at your facility within a few hours, but uh, would like to just put my name on the list. Now I have I have uh, filled out the forms that uh, you had referred to the email and so forth, and I filled those out. Uh, it's been quite a long time. Is there a way for me to check to make sure I'm on the list? Uh, the problem with is we you see the the point is. We are not allowed to to communicate freely with patients by email, mm -hmm. and this is why we had to go through this through this IRB approved electronic questionnaire. This was a frustrating time for both all the patients reaching out to us, us not responding or us not being able to properly respond. And this such an electronic questionnaire is very helpful, and at least will help a certain portion to patients to get into the right study. The problem is it's not a dialogue type of thing. So we we take the information, we, we process the information and take this seriously, of course. I mean, all this is regulated and we have audits internally and so on. But we do not, we, we only reach out as soon as we can enroll you in the study. Okay. So I have to apologize for not not reaching out to every patient and and there's only I only have two um, highly motivated really brilliant clinical research coordinators both are have a lot to do but nevertheless they are also responsible for for the wait list so it's it's we are slow sometimes but we are not slow when it comes to enrolling and then taking care of our patients thank you for thank that you. clarification uh, anybody else have a question before we say goodbye Yes, it's Randall here again. Sorry, Hi, um, I don't have a hand. Uh, um, I understand that the FDA has something called breakthrough device status that can help expedite something like this. That's my first part of it. And second is you mentioned multi, uh, multi-place uh, trials. Are you thinking about Toronto, Canada as part of that? Um, might certainly be an option you see um well and, and concerning the, the the breakthrough um we i i have the i'm fortunately working with first rate people i mean that have a track record in the medical device company and and there's also somebody who is really highly experienced with um in regulatory things and he has um huge experience with fda approvals i'm i'm pretty sure they they know how to bring this to as many patients as soon as possible, because that's the goal. That's the very goal. And I think based on what I've heard so far, money should not be the issue for this. Thank you. I, I know, like I said, I used to work in the medical device industry for Philips, and I'm very familiar with clinical devices and regulatory affairs. And it's it's it's, it's a long it's a long process, but it, it serves its purpose. It, it has. Uh, stop checks and gap measures that make sure that things get approved are are both uh, safe and effective. Anyone else have a question? Uh, go ahead, Lori. You have to unmute yourself. Um, have you had anyone with gastrointestinal issues see improvement? Or mm -hmm. did you have anybody with gastrointestinal issues in any of those studies? It's a very good point, yeah. Um, potentially, we had one or two patients um, um, uh, expressing in an anecdotal way some improvements. What I do, what I'm, what we are currently doing is, I have a, one of my PhD students is, um, I share one of my PhD students with Todd Coleman from the bio, from the School of Engineering. And he's one of the leading groups uh, working on um, measuring gut motility and and the oscillations, um, gut oscillations. And what we are going to do is we want to measure how the glove impacts um, these these gut oscillations and the interaction between brain. So it's a very important point. But I have nothing to report now. All this is in a preparatory state, but we take this very seriously because I think it's a very important part of Parkinson's disease. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much for that answering that question. All right, let me have time maybe for one more. No. Okay, I think that's I think that's all our questions. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Todd. Oh, hold on, I missed somebody. Uh, Drew, go ahead, Drew. You have to unmute yourself. I don't think you covered this, but why a glove? Why not? Why not a sock or a hat? Or <laughs> why? Why is a glove the essential element here? Hmm, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I don't think that it, it will test other types of devices. I've already tested another device in the past when I was still in Germany. Um, a sock or a sole, for example, stimulation of the uh, of the feet is is not so trivial because the, the the pressure with which you stimulate when you, for example, walk varies a lot. This may not only have wanted effects. The It was a starting point. Whenever you start with a new treatment approach, the first thing is what you want to make sure is if you don't have side effects, relevant side effects or any side effects is you go for high dosage. That's why we start with in total four hours a day, or although we don't think that we need it, at least not for six months or something like this. Second, the, the fingertips have one strategic advantage, and that is the small portion of the skin surface corresponds to a large portion of the brain. And it in this way, we have an entry point we go into the sensory thalamus, from the sensory thalamus to a relatively large point of the sensory motor cortex. And then we know from computational preclinical and other clinical studies um, that these desynchronizing effects propagate. There might also be other body parts and other ways to stimulate it. We're working on this. We're also developing devices for this currently. But the first step is to show that this works and this uh, in, in the most professional way, so to speak. And then we'll also try other devices, mm -hmm. other approaches. Great question, great answer. Thank you very much. All right, well, I think that's everybody's question. So thank you again very much, Dr. Toss, for coming today. We, we are all definitely 100% behind your research and we uh, hope that uh, everything goes well and that it, it will reach, uh, reach our hands, uh, so to speak. Uh, in the near future, sometime in the near future. But we wish you and your team all the best, and we thank you for all of your hard work and efforts on behalf of the Parkinson's community. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation, and I wish you all the best.